really very influential with his Golden Report thing. And um, I love his subsequent book as well. Um, I'm a little daunted, not only by the company, but by my task, which is to talk about Pastor Friday writing in 10 minutes. <laughs> We're starting to speak here of um, actually quite a long period. You know, it's, it's been a while. And moods and conditions, both national and international, have shifted uh, to the point where the term post aparte um, has already been questioned. Uh, Donald actually mentioned that um, Lauren Kruger and others have spoken, have preferred to speak of post anti apartheid writing rather than post apartheid writing. Um, the implication there being that apartheid isn't really necessarily that over. But at least there's a shift in terms of the kinds of um, literary strategies that are being used. Um, more recently, I'm starting to see the term post-transition writing emerging as well. Um, and what that reflects is a kind of disenchantment uh, after the, the Lubecki era. Um, lately, there's been an even more dramatic questioning, a, a fascinating <coughs> intervention a few years ago by uh, my colleague at Stonewash, Leon Le Coq. Uh, uh, an essay called um, South African Literature is Dead, Long Live Literature in South Africa. And uh, Leon's point is actually a very interesting one. He argues that really there wasn't uh, such a thing as South African literature, except that it was a way of suturing a seam, uh, working across a kind of racial divide. But of course, you know, uh, that activity also depends on this rift and on this, uh, you know, on this, on this this gash, this wound uh, that you're trying to, to overcome, right? Um, so that if, that if that divide officially disappears, it's almost as though the very raison d'etre of South African literature um, is no longer there at the moment when some of the obvious obstacles to national literature are, are then removed, right? It's a very interesting argument um, in that, uh, and, and I think it's an argument that's quite uh, savvy to the fact that, that South Africa became a newly democratic nation in an era of globalization, right? So at a very moment when national boundaries were being uh, made porous by various uh, uh, developments, uh, immigrants uh, uh, streamed, you know, you know the same thing in the States, right? Immigrants coming, a sense of a porousness of the nation, um, but one that requires uh, a different kind of production of nationhood and very often a kind of commercial production of nationhood and also, also ethnicity, right? Um, one, one phenomenon is that whereas under apartheid one had, let's say, exiled writers and writers within the country, now we, we actually have South African writers who simply migrants, economic migrants, right? So we have Frankenbach living in New York and Paris. We have, um, gosh, even Fenty living in Melbourne and Nakuru. We have um, Zex Medell living in Ohio for at least part of the time, right? We have an international body of writers and writers who write about all kinds of things, right? Recently, um, a very good uh, writer called Michiel Haynes wrote a book called Body Politic, which is about suffragettes in London, right? Or the Afrikaans writer uh, Etienne van Yeven has a book called Thirty Nights in Amsterdam, right? Um, so the question is, are these, is this then a national literature, right? Or do we have a situation where writers are drawing affiliations at will and um, internationally rather than trying to discover these broad, um, Affiliate, you know, horizontal uh, affiliations that are required for a, a sense of nationhood, right? And I think it's it's wonderful that that I read from his novel Sion because there is precisely a novel where Tolkien migrates uh, to Kilbert and to uh, to Ohio, right? Uh, having become tired of the sameness of mourning in an era of AIDS. Um, I could go on, but one. One phenomenon that I see um, in post apartheid writing is an emergence of uh, work concerned with the city. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read the wonderful uh, experimental fictions of uh, somebody like Ivan Vladislavich, who actually has just produced a very interesting um, novel in conjunction with the book of photographs by David Goldblatt, whose exhibition is really sort of 
the reason therefore for our get together here. Um, and I, I think that's interesting because you know in cities uh, you belong and you exist really in quite a different mode uh, from that proposed by nationality, right? National identity is in some ways a very um, abstract kind of identity. You have to sort of extrapolate into the past, right? Um, it's a, shall we say, a relation of disembodied extension, right? Um, whereas urban identities are existential, they're concrete, right? Um, uh, they're improvisational. You know, that's the mode of existence in a city. And, and, and that kind of existence is open to a kind of cosmopolitanism rather than strictly a, a sense of national identity. So I think it's fascinating that the city has been such a big obsession uh, in post apartheid writing, especially since the millennium, right? Uh, both in, uh, in fiction, in, in fine arts, and also in, in criticism. I think it's also important to remember <laughs> that we now are starting to see very young writers. You know, uh, one of the most popular novels, uh, uh, post apartheid novels, is a novel called Coconut. I don't know how good it is, but you know, Coconut is, is sort of like an, an aurea, you know. You, Black on the outside, white on the inside, right? It's about uh, black identities in, uh, in a, uh, a very commercial uh, era. It's you know, very much an engagement with commodity culture and the identities that that, that uh, provides. Um, so here is somebody writing at the age of 25, right? But perhaps not that much of a, a feeling for the experience, the terrible experience that, that uh, Stephen and described for us in the origin from the 80s, right? So uh, the first point that I would want to make, um, and I'll try to keep this brief, um, that's my, my mission. Um, uh, the first point I want to make is that there is a possibility that uh, South African literature as we knew it is dead, has become global, right? Um, but that that also allows for a, a different kind of writing to emerge, um, more transnational perhaps, or national in a different way. Uh, we are in a different moment. Um, however, I just want to make three brief points, uh, sort of get three brief headings, uh, under which we may see ways in which South African writing since the end of the apartheid has been concerned with the idea of the nation. I think that it is true that national projects are very often proleptic. Right? Someone Rashdi once said that, that writers sing the nation into being. Right? And so I think that what Stephen, in a way, was telling you was that the nation was being written in South African writing before, before the democratic nation actually existed. Right? Um, that said, I do think that the election of 1994 really did provide um, something new, something affirmative, something, you know, um, a, a feeling of rupture. Right? Um, even though you might say that you know, not all the dreams have been met, to be sure, that there are continue, you know, that we're not that post-apartheid uh, yet. Um, but there are many novels that we could point to that use the 1994 election as a kind of affirmative conclusion, right? Um, you might think of Andre Brin's novel, Imaginings of Sand, which ends with the female protagonist actually going to cast her vote with all the workers on the farm who are now recognized as family very utopian kind of ending. There's Marie, Marlene van, van Niekerk's wonderful, grotesque novel, Triomphe, which is about this white family, incestuous white family, um, who are thinking of um, this day in April really as the day when their monster offspring is going to have sex with somebody other than his mother for the first time, his 40th birthday. <laughs> this is funny, Jeff, it's out there. Um, but it's also election day, and so the novel ends with this you know, wonderful um, you know, mistake where painters come in to paint the house of the Benadis in new, fresh white. Right? But they never they sort of drift into um, some kind of acceptance of the new, right? There are other no novels of the transition, I think, um, uh, uh, Ways of Dying is a wonderful example, but there are others like Ivan Vladislavich's The Rest of Supermarket, which clearly um, have to do with um, emerging subjectivities, uh, transformations of political space and social space. Um, uh, 
some of you may have read the, the rest of Supermarket. It's about a very conservative guy who's a proofreader who wants everything to stay the same. There must be no errors, there must be no change. And he has to confront the horrible fact that his favorite hangout, known as the Cafe Europa, is closing down. Right? So anyway, you can see the whole novel as being a comic engagement with the fact of the, the Cafe Europa uh, closing down. The second uh, brief subheading I want to just touch on is um, the fact that post-apartheid writing um, certainly had to do with the um, investigation and the shaping of collective memories. I think it is clear um, that um, apartheid repress, repressed black voices, right? Uh, black history and its centrality. It also, um, with its focus on the urgencies of the present, um, repressed certain topics. Right? Uh, like the history of slavery, like the Creole uh, origins of Afrikaans, uh, and so forth. And I think in post apartheid writing, these topics, uh, these, uh, these uh, buried histories were rediscovered. Um, there's a critic called Shane Graham who has said that, that um, the, the key tropes of post apartheid writing are the archive, uh, the palimpsest, right? in other words, sort of a layered, with something imposed on top of another layer, right? And then quite simply digging, digging holes. Like there's, some, there's this recurrent image of digging holes. They all have to do with retrieving the past, right? I think the, uh, the work of the Truth and, uh, and Re Reconciliation Commission um, has to be seen as, in some sense, a literary work. Uh, it was all about stories, about telling stories, and about retrieving the past. It is, in a, in the, the report of the TRC is in many ways the, the great collective novel of post-apartheid South Africa. And um, there are many works, an entire archive of works dealing with the TRC, uh, you know, whether in documentary form, whether in memoir form, whether as, as you know, plays and so on. And not all of them seem to buy into the notion of the therapeutic validity of making private wounds public, right? Um, so that we have a novel like Ahmad Dangor's Bitter Fruit, um, which actually has the sections memory, confession, but then a final section called retribution, right? And of course the TRC was all was totally not about retribution. Um, but you know, these are works in which uh, I think uh, the scars of the past, and this is a uh, an image that I think is most vivid in Zay Smidala's uh, uh, Heart of Redness. The scars of the past <coughs> may mark with the presentness uh, of the past, right? Um, it has been said by critics, I think by David Atwell, that, uh, the, that apartheid era writing was, was fixated on the future, right? And that post-apartheid writing is Story, I think of um, uh, oh gosh, um, uh, the Devil's Chimney by Anne Lansman, uh, the um, 
Maria Salviati, that's it, the, the long silence of Maria Salviati, um, and, and, and of course, um, a heart of uh, redness most particularly. I just want to end with one final heading that I think um, it deals with a very crucial issue in post apartheid South Africa. <coughs> Uh, I want you to remember three things as I go into this. First, that the idea of sex across the color bar was a very important uh, trope in white South African writing. And um, uh, the critic Mahil Haynes, novelist also, has, has, says that, has said that there's something uh, of a belief in the political efficacy of sexual intercourse in this kind of writing. So sex is an important uh, topic in South African writing, but I think the meaning shifts. Secondly, I want you to remember that um, the nation is so often uh, imagined in terms of kinship, in terms of familial ties, right? No wonder that Marie van Heert uses the, the trope of the incestuous family to begin to uh, imagine the end uh, of, a, of, of a nation imagined in terms of, of kinship and family and so on. So bear that in mind. And then finally, uh, the third point just to bear in mind as I uh, go into my uh, closing point is that, of course, the uh, constitution that we adopted in 1996 is a very uh, rights-based constitution, a very uh, um, utopian constitution in many ways, and it guarantees gay rights. Um, so, uh, so the new South Africa in some ways involved a rejection of a regime that regulated sexuality in the name of racial purity. Regulated, and I, I, I would add, the sexuality of both straight and gay South Africans. Right? So I think it's just really fascinating because of all this baggage, all this background, um, that sexuality um, in various ways has been an absolutely key trope. I think, uh, uh, or, or key obsession, I should say, it's more than a trope. Um, how can the nation be imagined, right? Um, do we still have to use these biologistic notions of the family to begin to imagine a new nation? And I think the literature gives us an ambiguous picture. One thing that I might point out is that there are many narratives about rape, and we might wonder why. Why rape? I think, um, uh, think of Jane Kitsi's Disgrace, for example. That's the, the best known novel that has rape at its center. But there, there are many others, right? Of course, the fear of crime, you know, rape statistics are high in South Africa. This is part of it. But I think there's something else at stake here, and that is that rape is mythically imagined as a, a figure of a new and uh, exogamous beginning. Right? Uh, think of the founding of Rome with the rape of the Sabian women. Right? It's not to me a comfortable trope, um, but I think that the, the whole idea of interracial rape and of mixed race progeny um, at least dramatizes, however problematically, the possibility of a kind of creolized national identity. Right? Um, one that I would say stops short of the very idea of queering the family or of breaking away of uh, a familial conception of the nation. Right? Um, so along with rape, I think it is actually very interesting to uh, consider how often prostitution features uh, in, in New South African writing. And sometimes, peculiarly, like in um, Kaiselo Doker's very uh, tortured buildings roman, uh, The Quiet Violence of Dreams, uh, prostitution becomes almost like a way of imagining a new kind of unity and one that obviously is not based on that, um, that, uh, you know, that um, heterosexual family that was so clearly part of the way in which um, uh, the apartheid nation was imagined and also to some extent the new nation was imagined um, in, in, in the anti-apartheid struggle. So I think I'll leave there. There's obviously um, a great deal more to say, but those are just some of the major uh, patterns and tropes that I, that I see in post-apartheid writing. Thank you.
palliate to the present. Palliate the present. Would you like to say a little bit more about that idea? One of the, it struck me at first. Really, well, it, it, it just came, it just came really. Uh, it, it's not something that, um, I, I think that, you, 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 you see, how I came to that conclusion, it was, you know, from my interaction with, uh, with the so-called weak people. I have used so-called because that's what they are called, uh, said uh, that. When I asked them, okay, what do you call yourselves? They said, well, we don't belong to nobody. That, 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 that was all that the answer that, that I got. Uh, <clears throat> what, how, how this came about, you know, was uh, my interaction with them and the various versions of history that I got from the members of the community, you know, about their origins, about uh, you find that each, each one will come with a vision that will, will uh, transfigure the past in order to, to validate the present. Uh, to make things uh, better, you know. Um, for instance, when they talk of, of their origin, for one thing, they do remember, you know, their white ancestors by name. They remember those who came through Ellis Island. They have pictures of, 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 of them, so on and so forth. And uh, those who came from Germany, uh, because some of them did come from Germany, those who came from Ireland and so on. But when they talk of their Native American uh, ancestors, they talk in generic terms, you know. They don't remember them as individuals, these ancestors. The same with the African ancestors. And so you, you, you'll find that when, for instance, there is an opportunity, there, there, there was a big case in Ohio where the Shoni people were claiming, you know, some big chunks of of the state, you know, they were threatening to go to court because they felt that, you know, that land belonged to, to them. And, uh, um, and all of the people in Kilbert, you know, were claiming that they were shown. They were reinventing, you know, that, that you know, because um, to be shown at that moment, you see, uh, was something to, to be proud of and, you know, something that would benefit them materially. And there were many Shoni ancestors who came during that period, you see. When other situations arise, you find that the ancestry is reinvented again to suit the new situation. And in all cases, it is always to make things better. Remember, this was a community that was marginalized, you know, for, for, for a long time. They only got guest lines in the 70s, for instance, you know, um, and other utilities, you know, that America long took for granted, you know, and long been taken for, for granted. So these were marginalized people. And that, 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 that's part of why they have this pride uh, about their heritage. They see themselves as people of the future, you see, like, because they think that, well, one day everybody will be like us. You know, they, they come from different uh, racial groups and so on and so forth, you see. And therefore, the, the very pride in that heritage is part of that, you know, that act of palliating uh, the, the pain of the present. You, you see that. At least once, once we were warriors, 
ones who were great. You see, we come from, you know, uh, these great people, these great Native American warriors, uh, great African warriors, even though we don't remember them by name. And so on. Does this image in any way resonate with what's happening in South Africa? <laughs> <laughs> These are the experts in as far as that is concerned. Uh, it might. I'm sure. Yes. Yes. <laughs> village that's going to be built or you know there's a debate about it in uh, uh, the heart of redness and, and they write very interestingly about various uh, ethnic groups who try to you know um, as it were market their identities in the new south africa it's very different from apartheid but you know that's the you know uh, one of the ways in which you know global capital forces you to think about identity and, and, and about the past and about tradition um, I think Zakes is um, understanding that tradition is, is always an invention, it's, it's a very productive one here. Thank you. Still related to that, and I'm having a difficulty with the question because I'm not very clear on where I'm going with it. Um, but looking at history as a kind of reimagining history as a kind of different present, and some of the things that you said about the transition, not just presaging the, the next step, but um, creating it in a sense. Um, it seems to me that the most difficult political situation is um, the sense of oppression, um, leaving peoples open for the worst. And I'm wondering where the literature of political goes with that, and anything you have to say about it. Let me take it on that, and, um, and actually think about the, the previous question as well. I mean, it's interesting because um, it feels to me that um, um, the future in South African writing will, in lots of ways, still be the past. I mean, I think there may be all kinds of new topics, and I think uh, Rita outlined them just, just fantastically, and gave us a great map of what's, of what's going on. But it feels to me, just sort of intuitively, I, I, and that's the only way I can put it, that uh, some of those traumas of the past are going to really emerge in the future. That uh, the, the palliative aspect will, uh, will go through another cycle, and that uh, the past will be dug up again. Celebration is um, obviously intoxicating, and even as everybody knows about all the problems that South Africans face, whether they be AIDS or unemployment or crime or whatever it is. Um, yeah, um, so, you know, but there is this sense of the miracle, there was the TRC, there was all that unearthing, and that, so it's, it's sort of subdued for a while, and other topics get explored, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if in writing to come, some of these topics come back right to the surface again. And um, so I don't know whether that addresses your question. It feels to me, and again, I can only say it's based on, on you know, the, the work that I've done or the, the kind of reading that I do, is that, the, and sort of what I try to suggest in what I was saying is that the, the politics of the writing doesn't conform to the politics of the political. And so even when Rita was talking, you know, about the disintegration of the family, the reconstruction of the family, you know, I'm thinking of a novel, Actualized People, which is all about the disintegration of the family, or even Burger's Daughter, which is about the complex uh, heritage of the family, uh, or uh, in Kutsia's Age of Iron, um, you know, <laughs> the current daughter in the United States, and she's dying of cancer. You know, the family is not the family. 
Um, and I'm thinking in Interwood and Bailey where the family is not the family because, you know, the central character is cheating on his wife and raping a student, you know, it's, it's that sort of thing. And so, uh, and in, in, um, uh, in Ways of Dying, um, you know, what the family is, is open to question. The, uh, Taloki's father is someone who's absolutely suppressed him, told him he's an ugly child, can produce nothing. But here is this new family that he and Maria set up, but it's not specifically the national family. And, and I think even in that apartheid era, it wasn't the national family. There were other topics. And I think it's a work of um, sort of very close reading to, to begin to, to figure out what the story is, what the narrative is. If all the fiction we're doing were uh, uh, providing recognition of the known, there would be no reason to read that, basically. So I think we have to be you know, very attentive to the other kinds of stories that it's telling. And to me, retroactively, looking at the 1980s, it seems to me that even as we thought we knew the kind of story it was telling, maybe we didn't. Maybe there were, there were other very good stories there, and that those will rise to the surface again. John? Well, you know, in light of what you just said, uh, I was, as I listened to you, Ross, thinking about you know, the trends in popular uh, novels, particularly in Afrikaans, like this new novel that people you know, devour my pockets, plausible. You know, uh, how do you all deal with something like that? I don't know plausible exactly, but I, I do want to say something about crime. Um, I think that you're absolutely right that there's been a proliferation of um, just discourse about the crime in South Africa. Like, you know, you talk about so and so was mugged, and you know, all these crime horror stories and so on. And there's also been um, you know, a wonderful emergence of South African uh, crime fiction writing. I don't know if you know the, the work of the young May, it's really fun to read. Um, and I think that, again, in the anthropologist, the Komarov's work, there's a very interesting um, sort of rationale for this emergence. Uh, that they talk about how um, an emphasis on the theatrics of law and order um, is, is very often a, a sign of the weakness of the state, right? Uh, and so that here we have you know, a, a very difficult situation for a government like the ANC, succeeding basically a police state what do you do uh, with law and order, right? Uh, how, do you, how do you give the sense that the state is delivering in its basic services, and especially in uh, the provision of law and order, right? So for me, um, that's a, a very interesting uh, political logic for the emergence of a whole variety of, 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 of um, a crime, you know, crime of, 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 of every sort, whether serious, whether popular, um, I'm sorry I can't comment um, more on, on, on class work, I haven't read it, but it sounds to me like it could fit within this kind of more general, um, general um, context. Thank you. Um, but there, uh, some criticism is beginning to 
to emerge, and it certainly is burgeoning. Uh, Imran Kavadia just has a new novel out. Uh, uh, Pallavi Rastogi at uh, LSU has, has quite a nice book on uh, Indian South African writing. But I think that's going to be, um, it's going to be interesting whether one sees it as um, uh, South African or as part of you know, other narratives of the Indian diaspora. Uh, Rastogi's book starts out with uh, sort of an interesting argument about how South African Indians tended to see themselves as South African in the first instance, precisely because they were struggling to have the rights of citizenship and so on. Um, and, and I found that a very interesting starting point. Um, I'm not so familiar with the literature, but I do think it's starting to get critical attention, and that it is important, so that part of your question is, Valuable and thank you. Yeah, I think um, uh, you know, what I'd say is that um, you know what is it? You know, we, we, we use the term South African literature. I, I don't have a problem with talking about South African literature, but what does it mean? You know, if we talk about American literature or you know or British literature, do we expect it to conform to a certain pattern? Line? Especially in the current era, what is what is British literature? You know, it's in its own way, it's a post-colonial literature. Take people like Carol Phillips or Zadie Smith or. Uh, Monica Ali, uh, you know, uh, and American literature is similarly disaggregated. So to me, it's not surprising, and in fact, not even a problem that South African literature should yeah. take many different forms, and that some of those forms should be some sort of commonly based or even ethnically based. Uh, I think there's a great tradition of, uh, of Asian writing in South Africa, and, um, and as we know, given the current controversy, you know, the history that goes a long way back um, um, to Gandhi and beyond. Uh, in South Africa. So uh, to me, the, the, the problem only makes sense if one thinks that one has to think within a national paradigm in, in that the writing has to be about the national question. Okay. But I, you know, I, I think everything we're saying um, sort of implies that it doesn't have to be about the national question, that there are many other interesting questions that emerge, some of which uh, have come through his eggs and does writing, some of which uh, Rita outlined uh, you know, brilliantly here. Um, so, um, and, I, and I think that the perspective that emerges in the current era, seeing this kind of disaggregation, actually enables us to go back into the past as well. And think about it, I mean, what, what did it mean to be a Sapphire Town writer in the 1950s? You know, Canton and Casey and so was it, was it just an, it wasn't just a national question. I, I really don't believe that was the case. They were very local in the same place that um, Malin Panikirk is writing about, you know, decades later talking about a polyglot, urban, dispersed, disaggregated kind of reality which was improvised every step of the way. You know, that people were improvising their identities. So um, I think that there is literature that comes from South Africa whose atmospherics we can detect. You know, when you see it, you know it. But it, uh, it's only a problem of terminology if we expect a certain version of that. that is the, the perspective that I have. Any more questions? You have another question. For all three of you, do you know who's reading South African literature? <laughs> Particularly in South Africa. Yeah, well, I I know who's reading my novels. Especially specific novels. Yeah. Yes. Um, I know, for instance, that uh, the Madonna of Excelsior became a bestseller in South Africa because of African women. You see. Um, it, it, <coughs> that book is very popular with African women. And, um, and, 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 and this is uh, this is mostly anecdotal growth, you know. Younger women or older women? Yeah. Younger or older women? Um, across the board. This is anecdotal in that uh, there they, they are no figures that I can give you and say, here are the figures. But uh, it's from the places I've been invited to, to talk to, you know, in the Free State, in the in Forest Bank, 
and uh, where I found that all my leaders they were African women for that book. You, you, you see. Um, and people who, who, who talk about it, you know, African women. Uh, 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 but that, that, that's not the case with all of my novels. A novel like Black Diamond, it's uh, mostly black people who read that book. You see. Um, don't ask me why. But uh, I mean, maybe the, the themes that the, the novel deals with and so on. You know. Scion in the United States, again, uh, is mostly black women. And it was even selected by a black magazine called Essence, you know, as, as, they are, as their book club, you know, a book of the month or whatever. Uh, and they took me on, on a national tour. I, I went to every state, you know, many cities. And in all those gatherings, it, it, it was mostly African American women. Uh, who, 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 uh, you know, so, so there, there is that. I know with the way Cola, for instance, it, it has very little readership in South Africa. And most, the biggest readership it has is with Europeans in translation. Especially in Sweden, for instance, that's why you know the, the sales have been very high. Now, I I I don't know whether it's Swedish women there or men as women. I I have no idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there is that. The, uh, I don't know what the dynamics are. You see, uh, and, and I think maybe uh, somebody who's interested in, in that field should, should actually make. A research that goes further than the, the anecdotal that I'm telling you here to, to find out exactly uh, why African women in, in this case, you see, and why black women in, in, in the other case, or whether actually these observations are, are, are accurate or not. But, 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 but I think we, they are accurate, right? in, in, in these observations. That, that I mean. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> and, uh, I hope you